Hello and welcome to Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. I'm your host, Will Bachman, and I'm excited to be here today with my friend Mike Coleman, who runs the firm Stratus Key Advisors. He's a former CIO at several different companies. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you, Will. It's great to be with you. So, Mike, you were most recently CIO at EPRI. Tell us what EPRI stands for and about the work that they do. Sure. EPRI stands for Electric Power Research Institute. It's a firm of a little over a thousand people with a large number of PhDs, lots and lots of scientists, and they perform uh, primary research for the power industry, both in the United States and uh, globally. And they have several different sectors. They have a large nuclear sector, and then they focus on transmission and distribution and generation and environment. And they've been around since uh, the 1970s. So like, what would they do for, let's say, the nuclear industry? Is it, um, it it's a for-profit organization or? It's actually a nonprofit organization that's funded by the utilities. So it's a membership type, uh, membership type organization similar to Gartner, uh, where utilities uh, pay to join the organization. They can also pay for individual uh, extra research, uh, individual projects. They can join together to form to do research for special projects. And so uh, in the nuclear industry, they focus a lot on safety uh, and data analysis. Uh, some examples of, of what they do is uh, a lot of practice around non-destructive evaluation. So that's uh, a mouthful term to describe uh, the inspection of high pressure pipes uh, without taking them apart. So they do uh, x-ray and sonar and, and um, so they they continually develop methods to be able to inspect uh, power plants for safety. Uh, they have lots of training that they do. Um, they do a lot of research, long-term research around storage of nuclear fuel um, and the efficient operation of the plants and that sort of thing. Great. And then on, on the uh, uh, transmission and distribution side, it's uh, everything from really basic research, uh, like uh, there's a gentleman that focuses a lot on corrosion and how to prevent corrosion, which is a, something like a $6 billion problem globally, uh, but also much more uh, advanced things like the use of drones to inspect power lines and the possibility of uh, uh, using artificial intelligence image recognition uh, to receive those images from drones and then determine if uh, uh, if an insulator is bad or if you know poles are leaning or there's uh, too much sag in the lines and that and that sort of thing. So everything from the basics all the way up to pretty advanced stuff. And then more recently, this idea of digital twins, uh, especially in the nuclear industry as well, where uh, the the equipment, the controlling equipment inside a nuclear power plant will throw off a lot of data about what's going on in the plant. And that data can be fed into a digital twin where it can learn about the operation and then uh, you can simulate actions. So uh, to, to grossly oversimplify it, if you wanted to turn a knob from nine to 10, you can simulate what that would uh, lead to uh, based on the actual behavior of a particular plant. And sorry, that's a digital, what's that word? It's a digital twin. Twin, twin, okay. T-W-I, got it. Yes, yeah. And my understanding is that at, at EPRI, you as a CIO, you were leading efforts to build up their kind of cybersecurity capabilities as well as helping the industry think about how to manage these massive new volumes of data where it used to be you'd have the utility you know person come to your house once a month and check the meter and now there's smart meters that are throwing off kind of real-time readings of everybody's utility power consumption there's massive changes with uh with distributed energy resources people with solar on the roofs producing power now putting it into the grid 
So just the amount of data in the utility industry is just going completely exponential. And you were working on efforts on how to utilities can share that data, you know, monetize that data, um, keep that data safe. Tell us about, you know, your work at, you know, in that space. And also I understand that that's kind of what you're focusing on not now with your own uh, consulting practice. So tell us a little bit what's going on with data in the utility industry. Sure. Well, as you mentioned, uh, the, the amount of data that's available now is is volumes larger, many, many times larger than it's it's ever been. And you went from understanding what a home used uh, from that manual meter reading once a month to now in five minute increments, let's say. And <clears throat> so the ability to see uh, what's going on uh, on uh, on a on a minute by minute basis, and then try to understand what's driving that uh, type of usage, becomes a much more interesting question. And we're also moving from an era where, you know, loads were really predictable. Uh, not that much changed inside a house uh, for, from an electricity standpoint until electric cars came along. So I guess the biggest thing you could do is maybe put in a pool, and and have uh, have you know, a lot of electricity consumption around the pool, but now there's there's this uh, uh, pretty rapid adoption of electric vehicles, and if everyone in the in the neighborhood got an electric vehicle, most neighborhoods probably couldn't uh, couldn't provide enough power for that. And so one of the things utilities have to do is uh, understand the usage patterns and the growth patterns and try to divine sort of how. Uh, particular areas are adopting the rate at which they're adopting uh, electric vehicles and then plan to expand the power capacity into those areas. And it's very different, as you can imagine, from different parts of the country, even different neighborhoods within uh, larger metropolitan areas. And so this, this data becomes very important. However, at the same time, it's very sensitive data because this is a, a picture of how you personally are using and consuming uh, electricity. And so it's uh, pieces that are classified as personally identifiable information. And so it has to be a lot of care around anything that it can identify a particular household. And uh, then there's the broader industry question. So if you're a large utility and you have a lot of this data, you can you can learn something from it. There's the general desire to uh, collaborate with other people, other uh, companies, and see more broadly. The more data you have, the better you get at uh, learning and prediction. But at the same time, the growth of all this data, uh, way outside of the utility industry and pretty much every industry, it's also leading to this question of, well, hey, I have all this data now. Uh, maybe this is now a competitive advantage for me. And power industry is changing faster than at any time in my lifetime. Um, and so much more competitive, uh, lots of mergers and acquisitions and divestitures, and some of them um, splitting up their transmission and distribution from generation. Uh, and all these all these different slices as people try to find the right uh, the right model that maximizes the efficiency. And then, as you also mentioned, all of these new uh, uh, distributed energy resources, uh, rooftop solar, consumer rooftop solar, plugging into the grid, uh, the need to understand what that capacity is and control it and see the status of it becoming a really, really complex, massively complex uh, challenge. Um, so you add all those things together and then you layer on top of it a regulatory environment that says uh, this data, because it can contain information that can be sensitive for a number of reasons, whether it's because it's critical infrastructure or because it's personal information um, or because there's value to it and so there's a regulatory environment that comes into play. And then the cybersecurity uh, uh, aspect of it as well. Uh, so if you're out there and you have lots and lots of meters, they have to be uh, very secure and the data that comes off of them has to be secured. 
And so it's hard enough to secure it and do the governance just for your own organization. And then when you try to multiply that and say, let's get 20 utilities together and see if there's a slice of this data that we can uh, share. And now you've got uh, 20 uh, legal departments that are having an opinion about what needs to go into those agreements. You have 20 data governance groups. You have uh, uh, 20 cybersecurity groups. Um, and, uh, and then every year, at least a couple of times a year, there's some kind of new regulation that comes out in the utility space, specifically from the government, that uh, adds complexity to it. And it's usually in response to some kind of, of an incident. And so uh, then there's one more piece that adds just a bit more complexity, which is enforcement actions. Every now and then um, the government will do an audit and uh, levy a fine against uh, uh, an organization and for some kind of, uh, you know, cyber shortcoming or data governance shortcoming, usually a cyber shortcoming these days. And that causes a reflex to pull back and lock down. So you have all these competing interests, the desire to share, the desire to learn, desire to monetize, uh, competing against fear of losing it, very aggressive nation states that are not only trying to steal the data, but to break into your networks as well and get to all these devices that are feeding information. Um, and then of course, just the general liability of having a cyber breach and the loss of trust and all of those kind of things. So it is a, it is a massively complex problem and we are, we are, as an industry, very far from solving it universally. We're trying very hard to solve it individually right now, but, uh, but just a massive challenge. So at EPRI, uh, we were able to create a very skilled cybersecurity team, very, very widely respected, uh, who uh, received all of these uh, cybersecurity questionnaires uh, one of them from uh, one major utility was 1,600 questions. Uh, another one was hundreds and hundreds of questions, but not the same questions and controls that the first utility did. So we had to have a whole team of people that synthesized these provided responses. And then responses aren't good enough. You also have to actually execute on all those controls. And we created a data governance team and education process for our researchers and scientists about uh, why we were doing all this and how to comply. And we had to try to make it as smooth as possible so that the process of governance didn't get in the way of the research. So uh, we set up a platform that had standard ways of bringing in data overlaid by governance processes that had legal agreements behind them and methods of auditing them and then um, uh, teams that of course watched from the cybersecurity perspective and were proactive and then we spent quite a lot of time interacting with various utilities to demonstrate to them the capabilities and the controls that we had so that they could trust uh, the processes that we that we had all right bunch of areas to explore in there yeah one i'm just curious about curious about is uh why is it so sensitive the energy uses for a particular household i mean i guess i can imagine for one reason you could sort of tell if somebody is away from their house it would be a good you know no one a good time is to rob them if you, you see you know a household all, all of a sudden you know like not using much electricity uh for a period of time like oh they're you know away from their house a good time to break in but i mean beyond that um if you ask me in my relative ranking of concerns that I have, I'd be a lot more concerned if someone has my, you know, financial info or, you know, healthcare info or something like that than if they know what my con ed bill is, you know, whether it's 200 or 500 bucks a month or something. But what, what are, what are some things that, you know, uh, a bad actor could do if they had my, um, you know, my energy usage bill? Can they, could you actually tell sort of what specific things that the person is running or uh, you know, like what are the concerns there? Yeah. 
gosh, there, there are two or three things. So, so the first reaction by me and everybody else is who cares, right? It's, it's just my electricity usage data. Um, but there, it gets more complex than that for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it, a lot of people viscerally react poorly to having anything about what they do packaged up and, and sold and or, or, or used and observed uh, with the idea that some action could be taken upon that. So um, that doesn't necessarily, sometimes it's rational. Sometimes it's just visceral. Uh, this is my information. Uh, I have to have electricity. You don't have a right to sort of examine this and pass it around. You know, the, there are fears to, of, uh, uh, the, of being shamed for using too much electricity or something like that. So that maybe you have a neighbor down the street that <clears throat> somehow would know that you consumed a lot of electricity or something. Like I said, it's not always rational, but if you take the, the view that everyone is an electricity customer, you don't get to curate your customers. Um, the range of people and the range of opinions about what you can do with their data is going to be all over the map. And so sort of by definition, some percentage of people are going to consider that to be their private information. That's sort of at the most base case. But then if you go up the chain into actual things that you wouldn't think of, um, uh, the devices you have in your house can provide um, in aggregate for one thing, um, indications of patterns or weaknesses. You mentioned one, of course, you know, are you away from, are you on vacation or are you, or are you in Florida for the, for the winter or whatever, that kind of thing. It could be, could be an indication, but these days there's some really weird things more than that. Um, you could determine, for example, um, if there were certain weaknesses in a, in a certain grid, and bad actors are surprisingly sophisticated these days. And if they just had a bunch of data, they can kind of figure out where to poke and make things go badly. Um, and, and so you just want to be careful with large amounts of data that have lots of indicators for, for that, for that reason generally. And, you know, have a rule of thumb just because you can't figure out right now what bad things they're going to do with it. Doesn't mean that they're not thinking about it. <laughs> and it's, you know, one of the things I've learned, being in the in the cybersecurity field in this particular industry for a long time is I'm always surprised at what crazy stuff they're going after out there. Uh, the other one that gets trickier, and this isn't really meter reading data, but this is that whole connectivity uh, visibility into what people have and what they're doing, is that um, if you if you take for example rooftop solar and the connectivity of rooftop solar into the grid well there's a there's a controller in your house and that's tied into uh, the internet and can feed information off to, uh, to the utility or whoever's whoever is controlling how much of that gets fed back into the grid um, you know there there have been a couple of demonstrations where uh, these weren't bad actors but there have been a couple of instances where uh, I think at one point someone uh, uh, sent a firmware update that made the um, controller broadcast out this bizarre frequency and was causing the, 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 the electronic devices in the house to act all wonky. And it took a little while to figure that out, but uh, but then if, if that kind of thing became known, which it could very easily then you start identifying vulnerabilities that if you could that if you could um, uh, enact uh, you could you could trigger those in mass you could you could just cause a lot of a lot of issues those are sort of the surprising things that come out when you go down this this connectivity into the house rabbit hole there's a lot of that already there but not a lot of it controls power into the house and so now we're, we're also moving from uh, meter data. Uh, there are several platforms out there now where each one of your breakers can actually uh, 
measure the electricity going through it, record a backup so that you can have a better idea of what your stove is using and your washer dryer and your water heater and different parts of your house and that sort of thing as well. So you, you can see how getting down into that, if it's throwing off data, it's probably controllable. And, and so that starts to raise uh, not just privacy questions, but um, uh, what would you what would you do if you were a bad actor with all that information? Okay. Now, in terms of monetizing the data, um, I understand that there are some companies out there that are um, effectively becoming, you know, creating a virtual energy source by being able to either go to commercial establishments or residential, and if there's a peak power usage and the utility needs to get more power, instead of buying more power from a generator, they can go to one of these companies that has agreements with commercial and manufacturing and so forth, who will get those companies to temporarily shut down some, you know, turn off some lights or turn off some refrigeration or so forth, um, which, you know, instead of creating power, basically just reduces the demand and they can pay people for that. And it might be cheaper than just producing more power at peak. Um, I'm, so I guess that's one use of this sort of data. What are some of the other you know, ways that uh, companies are monetizing this you know, energy usage data and data on the, on the grid? I think a lot of it has to do with how, how they can use that data and the learnings to become more efficient operators themselves. Um, and so if you're, com if you're competing, um, necessarily, if you're thinking of merging with another organization or, or, uh, or you're just trying to maximize your efficiency, uh, running your own transmission and distribution organization and that kind of thing, if you can, if you can become a lot better at it, then, and, and you do, and you do so because of all this data you're able to gather and you're able to run it through your machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms that can finally tune uh, all kinds of things, then um, then you become more profitable. Uh, and that might be a secret sauce. And you may not necessarily want everyone else in adjacent industries to, um, or adjacent markets, to know exactly how it was you're doing that. Uh, these are very competitive very competitive markets. And so I think they're seeing it more as internal efficiency data monetization. Um, I think I think right now they're very, this is my impression, very, very careful and cautious and reticent to sell data to anyone else. Um, you know, the, the, the blowback from that would be pretty significant. Uh, it's not like uh, the data that we get mined when we use Facebook and all this other kind of stuff that's already sold and it's sort of understood that that's that, that that's how it all it all happens or when you use your credit card and, and that sort of thing that flow of data is very heavily monetized um, the utility industry I would say hasn't at least as far as I'm aware been anywhere close to the forefront of of sort of gathering and monetizing that it's really from what I've seen uh, internally focused on on being as efficient as they can, um, not only for operations, um, but um, uh, equipment maintenance, for example. You know, the, the predictive predictive maintenance on equipment failing. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of data thrown off. You understand when something what was happening before it failed. Then you can take action before it fails next time, and so it increases reliability. And if it, if it decreases outages, it can also decrease the number of times they have to go pay either for, for power to come in or do what you just described, which is to go pay for somebody else to do. Uh, you know, when I was at a previous company, they would come to us. We had a huge generator on site. And they would actually ask us to turn our generator on and go off the grid for a bit. And they'd pay us to do that. So it's like you described. But if you're better at predicting and better at your maintenance because of the data that you're able to gather, you can perform better financially. But from what I've seen so far, um, very reticent to be in the data sales business. Okay. What are some of the key areas that you are focused on serving CIOs in the utility and energy industry? What sorts of problems are you working on? So, uh, 
you know, there are a couple of approaches going on right now and, and that I've, I've been uh, paying close attention to and helping out some with. Um, one is just this massive question of how do, how do you, you comply? And you know, the utilities themselves have huge projects going on. Um, the, the, the sort of joining together of data governance and cybersecurity controls um, but but also, you know, after the initial sort of lockdown of data from the regulations that came out um, about data sharing and governance and protection, there's still the desire to send data somewhere else and have it analyzed, even if it's just for you. Sometimes it's collaboration, like what EPRI is doing. Uh, sometimes it's just for, for your own use and you don't have the capabilities internally. And increasingly, with some of the artificial intelligence platforms, uh, you have to send the data to wherever that is. What I'm focusing on helping utilities do is navigate practical solutions to how to make that happen based on the work that I've done previously. Whether it's from developing compliance mechanisms to just the practical outworking of how do we uh, how do we bring together the right people to set up a, an infrastructure that can do this. Uh, some utilities are moving into the cloud. Others are still pretty locked down and on-prem only. And you know, each one of those uh, have their own governance and uh, cybersecurity challenges. Uh, but uh, so I'm, I'm focusing on helping them navigate all of those uh, different uh, hurdles that are continuing to change and be able to get to the optimization of whatever it is they're trying to get to as quickly as possible without having to learn everything from scratch. You mentioned before this crazy story of a utility that had a questionnaire with 1600 questions about how are you going to you know maintain IT security cybersecurity right. what what are some ways that you see forward for the industry to be able to you know collaborate better in terms of you know either sharing data between companies or at least you know having some economies of scale so, so that you know, AI could work across multiple data sets and, you know, provide value to those, you know, members without, you know, without needing to go through this crazy, you know, thousand plus questions. Right. Well, you know, it is when you, when you first see these things, there's just this despair that sinks in. It's like, man, how are we going to get through this stuff? And then when you realize that's just one, um, and you know, there, there have been some efforts and I, 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 promoted heavily some of the efforts to at least get to one set of questionnaires for the industries. And there's, it's really interesting. There, there's a desire to do that, but it's quite a ways off. Um, everyone is in compliance mode now and they've chosen their questionnaires and they've already had people fill it out. And so switching questionnaires right now is very burdensome. And so, uh, but I think ultimately some sort of standard evaluation procedure is going to have to emerge because it'll just, it'll just melt down. You just won't be able to share data uh, to collaboratively do, do research. There is a company that um, uh, out of, out of the, the Boston area is doing some really interesting uh, uh, approaches to this, which is just flipping it all on its head. They've developed a it's a company called Via Science. They've developed a a method to create the AI models specifically for the utility industry. And they get around all of this data sharing stuff by uh, by pushing the model to the data and then very securely. Um, they they because they did it specifically for that industry. Um, they started with all of the security and governance processes first. And, and so that's an interesting way around it. We may see more of that, which is, um, okay, you run your own stuff and then you share the subsets of the learnings. If you, if you feel like it, or if a central organization says we have a, we have a study we'd like to do that you actually push 
the the AI models, <clears throat> excuse me, the models into the utilities where the data sits. And that actually has a potential to solve a lot of problems. Uh, everyone that I've talked to sees this when it comes to collaboration, this huge um, barrier. So I think for the foreseeable future, you're going to see data just park where it is because utilities have to be comfortable that it's controlled and governed. The process of pushing it out to someone else is very burdensome. It'll happen. It'll happen to one organization to do a specific um, task and then pull results back in. But it'll be much faster if you don't have to do all that, if you can qualify a particular uh, process that says, okay, everything stays where it is. We know what the queries are. We know what the models are. Push those into the data, do its thing, you know, improve the model and get the model back and maybe share that. So maybe you're just sharing a model. You're not, you're not really moving the data around. So that's a, that's a potential uh, uh, model, at least where, where it seems uh, to solve a lot of problems. You know, there are two or three issues with it. One, on-prem data with your own private circuits, you could move data around. It doesn't really cost you a lot of money. Uh, but as you come into the cloud, you may be aware <laughs> it's free to put data into the cloud. It costs money to take it back out. So if you're if you're dumping these massive amounts of data in, meter reading data and all other kinds of things, just digital twin data, uh, and you're and you're cranking away at it inside your cloud instance, and somebody says, "Hey, can you send me a copy of that? I've got a really cool AI model I want to run it to." That could actually end up being really expensive. Just to say, "Sure, I'm going to push this data out," because the models right now are it costs money for data to exit your instance of the cloud. So uh, I think more and more it's going to be leave the data where it is, um, secure it, govern it. Um, you know, bring bring the experts to the data rather than than uh, move it around. And I think it's going to negatively impact collaboration for a while. Um, but ultimately, I think the commoditization of the governance and the cyber controls will happen. We're probably five to ten years away from that. And, and five years will be very optimistic. It'll ultimately have to happen, but. The forces working against it right now are very strong. Mike, this has been a great discussion. If anyone wants to follow up with you or learn about your firm, where would you point them online? Uh, yes, first of all, thanks for having me on. It's great to catch up with you. Um, you can visit uh, the website at stratuskey.com. That's stratus is in cloud, stratuskey.com, or email me at mike at stratuskey.com. And uh, really appreciate the time today. It's really good to talk to you. Fantastic. Mike, thanks a lot. We will include those links in the show notes. And thanks for listening.